Okay, who wants to do a real quick recap on Heraclitus? Heraclitus is archaic, it is. And what element of fire? Fire, and that's associated with change. And then we said, it's the nickname Heraclitus the Absurd, because it looks like he's making up contradictions. The way up and the way down are one of the same. could say that they are correlatives, to use the Aristotelian terminology, good and evil are opposites that are related to one another. Evil is the lack of good. Now we'll get into that sometimes people think that good's the lack of evil, and that's a complicated issue that we'll get into a little bit later, which is actually not the case. Um, evil is a privation or a lack thereof. Um, but it's clear that they're opposites, good and evil. How could they be the same? Well, he says something. What does he say? Physicians cutting and burning and torturing sick men in every way, <laughs> yet complain that they do not get as much pay as they deserve from the sick for what they do is good for diseases. What is he getting at there? What happens if you get bit by a, a rattlesnake? How do you, what medicine do you get? No, so, yeah, that's not a good idea to. Antivenom, what's antivenom? All right, so, now, if you gave yourself, or think about this, he's talking about cutting and burning. If you're not sick and you have nothing that needs to be healed, and you cut and burn yourself, that's bad. However, isn't that what's necessary if you have some type of ailment? You have to do surgery and cut. 
So what this is, again, is more of the dialectic creating. They're one and the same, but if you're sick and you apply what would normally be a negative in terms of your health, well, two negatives. If you're sick, you negative. Cutting is generally speaking negative. Two negatives give you positive. Health works that way. Medicine and health work that way. And so that's what he's pointing out here. Let's see. Any other questions about Heraclitus? Before we move on to Parmenides. Parmenides. Mnemonic device? Do you want it? Yes. Parmenides Parmesan cheese. Man. <laughs> Sometimes for some people that actually works. I hope for others it doesn't make it even more complicated. So remember an arche, an arche really needs to be a fundamental explanation that explains all things. Again, getting down to the bottom of it. What are the building blocks of reality? Or put another way, what is it that all things have in common? If you get that, then haven't you explained a basic principle of all reality? But the problem is we need to put the question mark down far enough. Maybe we, we might leave out certain things, and you can see each pre-Socratic is doing this to their predecessor, critiquing them because, well, you didn't go far enough. What is water being held by? Earth. Okay, you keep going, keep going. What is it that all things have in common? Parmenides probably thinks out of all of pre-Socratics most deeply about this and pushes the question mark down the furthest. So if you have a grab bag of everything that could exist, and does exist, and then wrote it up on the board, although it would take forever, and then find with all the properties and attributes, what is it that everything that exists has? Plutonium. Plutonium? Really? I hope this doesn't have plutonium. Uh -huh. What would you say? Matter. Matter? What about left and right? Atoms. Does left and right, up and down, have matter? A purpose? Um, what about accidents? Those are purposes. Just maybe not the purpose that you wanted. <laughs> Chance. Chance. Meaning. Meaning. What about meaningless things? Or maybe you said there is a meaning. Uh, maybe intrinsically, no, but anybody can attach whatever meaning they want to. Not physically correct, but keep going. Concept? What about the things that you haven't apprehended yet? Don't say nobody's. Maybe, uh, for example, Think about before we discovered uh, background radiation or microwaves. There was no concept of it, but it existed. We just didn't know about it. So, for example, if I wrote a dog is a canine, uh, a triangle. is a free 
three-sided geometrical figure. This angle is at 180 degrees. House. So imagine if you could put up everything that exists in the universe, even non-material things, like relations, left, right, numbers. And then I give you a red pen or a green pen. And say, circle the lowest common denominator, or what all the things that exist have in common what would you, well, the triangle sharing canineness? Yeah, you got it. You got five minutes What is it that all things that exist have? They exist. They exist. Existence. <laughs> yes. Bean. <laughs> Bean and cheese burritos. <laughs> That's what everything has deep down inside once you get down to the bottom of it. Dang. So, what is his RK? It is being. Now, that's a difficult concept. In fact, it's the most abstract concept that you can think about. And the more abstract you get in thinking about things, the more abstract your thoughts are, the more difficult they are to apprehend. That's why you see this with little children when you're trying to give them a simple arithmetic problem. 2 plus 3 equals 5. And they say, huh? So what do you have to do? Because that's an abstract concept. What do you do? You bring them, you give them a re-entry program right back down into the material world and go, well, look. And you grab two oranges and three oranges, and you have them count five. Remember in the little uh, arithmetic books in like first, second grade? Don't you remember that far back? They would do that with the pictures of the bananas and the oranges, and you had to add. Yes? My daughter always asks me, what's two plus two plus one? But it's not 800. And so she goes, no, 500. And it's like, where do you get 500 from? <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> so you haven't figured out why she No, she always does it. She always does 100 plus single number. So I think she means 100 plus 100 plus 100. But she just says a single number after the 100. So it's like, if she does Yes, they said dang the same. Didn't Bill Cosby have a show where he'd have like, yeah. Can anybody do a Bill Cosby impersonation? Oh, yellow pops. <laughs> I'm putting yellow pops. Give up. <laughs> Don't you remember that? <laughs> no. Hey, you guys are too young to remember. Okay. If not, we have on YouTube. Right? Just look it up on YouTube. Okay. Can we have like class time where we just watch? Like, Bill Cosby? Yeah. yeah. Like, the whole <laughs> class time. And uh, write a philosophy paper on the philosophy. So, what's the easiest to grasp are tangible material things. And as we get more and more abstract, the more difficult it gets. So, I had a, a mathematics professor in my sophomore year of mathematics. And he would always have me come in to his office, like straight up like Goodwill hunting session, where he'd have me, he'd be sitting at his desk, and he had a pipe. It was so great. He'd be like, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I'd be doing these math proofs on the board, and he says, do you know why I'm having you come in and do these mathematic propositions before class? I'm like, no, tell me, why? Why am I coming? He says, because I'm training you mental calisthenics so that when you get to senior philosophy, you'll be able to do metaphysics. Metaphysics is the most abstract thinking that you can do. And metaphysics concerns being. 
the Greeks thought about this in the same way as mathematics is training. Mental calisthenics so that when you get up into the higher atmosphere where it's hard to breathe, you've been training. It's like, I got this. I can think about this. And you don't have brain farts when it does you've been training. The difficult thing about thinking about being, two things. You want to think about something, don't you want to define it? I ask you, think about a triangle. Well, it's going to help if you can define it. Now watch as we try to define what being is. It was easy with the triangle. It is a three-sided geometrical figure. But being is isness. Or is, is, is ness. Well, I got a lot of information right there. What's a pen? A pen's a pen. Okay, thank you. Now I can go home because I learned everything there is to know about. That's a tautology. So it can't be defined. One reason is think about it another way. To define, remember, make definite borders around something so that you include everything in the borders and exclude everything out. So if you define a triangle properly, you're going to get all the triangles, isosceles, obtuse, equilateral, and right angle triangles in there, and hopefully you make a good definition, leave out circles, trees, cows, dogs, and houses. So that means everything inside would be triangle if you defined it properly, and everything outside would be not triangles, not triangles. Watch what problem we have if we try to define being. Everything is in the box of being, and everything outside is what? Is. The opposite. Nothing. Not being. What does Parmenides say about non-being? Uh, number four, the one way, the only way to think basically is saying is that it is. What's the it that modifies, that he's modifying? Being is. That's all you can say. And it, it refers back here, cannot not be. Well, it's a double negative. Okay, we talked about two negatives make a what in mathematics? In logic and philosophy, it's actually a lot stronger than just positive. So if I said, you cannot not be in the room right now, what am I saying? Or am I saying you just happen to be in the room? You can be. No, stronger than that. You have to be. And so it's in logic, two negatives make a necessary condition, a must. So what you're saying is being is, and it must be. Impossible for it not to be. Have you ever played with trying to see how many uh, negatives you can have? How many people want an A? In the class, like, how many people do not 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 want to be in the class? Quick answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, how many people do not 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 want to have an A in the class? Not. Did I put four in there? <laughs> do you see how confusing I could get you to say, okay, congratulations, you're all getting an F. <laughs> how many people do not 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 want to be in the class? Congratulations, you see, because two negatives is going to make a positive. So if I said if you do not not want an A in the class, that equals what? Yeah, exactly. I'm just messing with you. But I'm just showing you how money 
language can be. Are you sure? I think that's why I'm more close to class. Just raise your hand for your grades. <laughs> okay, he goes on to state this is the path of conviction for the company's truth. The other, the other way of thinking, that it is not, it referring to being, that being is not and that it needs, must not be, I tell thee, is the path altogether unthinkable. So what he's saying, let me just retranslate that in a more intelligible way. What he's saying is that not only is it not possible for being not to exist, you can't even think it. Now, when people say that in philosophy, you cannot think it, you might be saying, well, I just thought it. Mm -hmm. But what they mean is, you can't think it without contradicting yourself. You think it's a thought, it's not. For example, can you think of a married bachelor? Why? It's a contradiction. Yeah, there's no. Um, and you can have all kinds of category errors like that. How fast does green smell on Monday? It's like, oh, I think he's having a stroke. Right? He's, he's, he's confusing his categories. He's getting color, days of the week, time, and, and smells all mixed up into one sentence. What's that? Or something? Yeah, right. Or, yeah, he, 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 uh, he took some psychedelics or something. <laughs> why can't you see what I'm saying? <laughs> because you're on drugs, that's why. I can't understand what you're saying. So, it's impossible to think that being is not. Why? Because it produces a contradiction, Parmenides states. To say that Being, which means existence, being is not being. It's like saying this is a pen and it's not a pen at the same time, in the same way. My brother is both married and unmarried at the same time in the exact same way. Well, that's just mental diarrhea, right? That doesn't make any sense. Wait, and the way you said that? And the way you said that, a pen could be a pen, but it can also not be a pen. Well, that's why you have to have the caveat uh, at the same time in the same way. So you can't have something be a pen, a marker, and not a marker at the same time uh, in the same way. Yes, sir. But I mean, you can have people who are married but that single. Yeah, well, that's why you have to add the, the second caveat. You're not meaning married in the same way, because they're acting as if they weren't. So, again, you can harken back to Heraclitus, where those apparent contradictions to solve that, that problem, and the word for problem in Greek is an aporia. Uh-oh, I've got an aporia. And the way that you break that tension is to make distinctions, like you said. Well, he's married, but he's surely not acting like it. So, to say that there could be non-being is to say non-being is. That's a contradiction. That's why Parmenides says the only thing that can be thought the one way it is, being is. What else can you say about it? So why did I bring that up? Because that goes to illustrate you can't put being in a box because every, and define it. Because everything outside would obviously be non-being. And non-being You'd be saying is, and that's a contradiction. So you're saying it is and it isn't at the same time, the same way? Yes, okay, you're a fool and contradicted yourself. 
the other problem, there is a distinction, and this is why we capitalize beam versus a distinction between beam versus beam. What's the distinction? You're being in the room right now. You're being a certain age. Maybe you're being tired because we didn't hook up the coffee. I'm a No, the way the, not time, but the ontology, the way you exist. So you exist, but you, it would be very strange to say, I am existence. No, you have existence, or you're participating in some way. How? Being in the back of the room, being standing up, being tired, being thirsty, being 23 years old, these different ways that you can exist. Or there is a pen. It's being a marker. But I can't say that this is being. So here's the problem. Being does not refer to anything in particular. And this is why it's the most abstract concept that you can even try to think about. It's what everything has in common, yet it can never be identified with one thing. Well, is that being? Just like numbers are abstract, somebody bring in the number two. You can't. You can try to illustrate it, but nobody's going to be able to show the number two. Can you repeat the definition you gave for being? What? Everything that exists, and remember, this really isn't a definition because we can't define it, but it's a, a, a form of description about what we're talking about. What everything that exists has in common. But cannot be identified through this. with anything in particular. So, one way to describe being, what all things that exist have in common, but is not uniquely identified with any particular one thing. So, is this being? No, it has been. Is that being? No. What about what people say is this marker is being stupid? So what you're saying is, it's in what way is this marker existing? In many ways. One of which it's existing or being stupid. That's what they're saying. So it's not the same thing as saying being, sorry, the pen is being. What you're saying is, it has been in a particular way of being stupid. Does that make sense? The stuff's difficult, I know. So what are things before they are being, like, before they exist? Before they exist? There's nothing that can be said about it. Because if you say, this marker before it existed, it's like, the marker that exists before it existed? Got it. Now, Parmenides saying something much further. He's saying the abstract general concept of being could never not be. Why? Because if you think that, you're a dummy, because you're contradicting yourself. So the only thing that you can say is that being is. Not as if we get any more information by that, but we're on the path, as he points out. Think about in another way. Oh, I want to actually give you some vocabulary real quick that will be quite important. You'll see this throughout philosophy. Has anybody had logic or critical thinking? Would you like to take it? Okay, I'll be teaching next next semester. Um, these things come up all the time. Particular versus 
universal. What has anybody heard of that before? What's that terminology? Would that be something that would be like, neatly understood by one culture or something that everyone can understand? Uh, it could be. Um, let's let's break it down even more simple. This marker marker versus marker. What's the difference? I'm sorry, keep going. Okay, keep going. This involves something now versus other things. Uh, yeah, you're getting, we're getting really close. Keep going. So particularly, it's what that means, like, um, like this is this pencil, where the um, marker can just be anything. It can be anything. Right. So, as you correctly pointed out, think of there as something s singular. either uniquely singular or few. So these three markers, this marker, universal. Has anybody had set, done set theory or anything in mathematics? Okay. The class of all things. Well, what things? All markers. So universal is always associated. So particulars are always associated with a unique singular entity or a few three markers. But universal is all. All of the class that we're talking about. The class, in this case, the markers. So universal, particular things are always physical. And I think this is what um, one of you were pointing this out. It's physically real. I can grab a particular marker. Universal is abstract and ideal. It's an idea. The number two, is it particular or universal? Universal, because you can't bring in a physical number two. You can try to illustrate the physical things that aren't number two like oranges or markers, but number two is an abstract concept. So it's always easier for us in our minds to grasp particular physical things. Mm -hmm. How about so the idea of like the left? To us, to the left, you can find it, but in space, to our planet, there's no left. To it. Yeah, I think the better term is um, not subjective because it's maybe it's relative to objects. Yeah, that's... So would that be uh, particular or different? Oh, great question. What do you guys think? Is left and right, which are relations... <laughs> oh man, I thought there was a globe over there. It's a flat globe. It's a flat earth! Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> it's a water block day. Uh, have you seen the joke globes? Oh. The astral the astralian glyphs, where they have it flipped upside down, but everything's right side up. So, what? Why is North America North America? Why not South? Why not the the Americans the South and Australia's up on the North? Well, it's exactly what you pointed. It just depends where your perspective is, because you could flip it and just say, well, it's just as equally. So on the globe, the, the kind of joke Australian globe, they have Australia, um, they just have it flipped, where this is all right side up, and we in the Americas are Do you like I said the Americas? I learned my lesson when I went to South America. Where are you from, America? Oh, we're Americans too. We're South Americans. It's like, ooh, a distinction. Nice one. <laughs> yes. It's like be precise with your language. Okay. 
I'm a North American from California. And this status you need you. Or you can just say that. I'm a status you need you. Is that even a word? Well, you'll learn a philosophy if it isn't a word you can make one up. When you don't have words to describe something, make it up. We just have to basically agree on what that word means, otherwise we're not going to be able to have a conversation. Cool. But language is kind of like that. Language is conventional, so no biggie. Okay. Number two is abstract. Marker. That tree is particular, but tree is universal because it includes the class of all it would apply to everything. Now you can see that it's much easier to get this than to get the concept of marker or markerness. These are two things versus the concept of two. And as you get more and more abstract, because the next step would be, if you have the number two, the next step would be number. Because the number not only includes number two, but the class of all numbers. And let's go steps further in our abstractness. So numbers, what do they have? Existence, you can keep going. Or their, their abstract thought, and you can keep going until you get to the most abstract thought, which is being. And that is the most difficult because it can be associated with nothing in particular. So that's why the Greeks, and my mathematics professor, was having me do mathematics because mathematics is abstract, and metaphysics is the discipline that is the most abstract of all the disciplines. And it's not metaphysics like you see in the bookstore at Barnes & Noble. That's like New Age spiritualism. And I, I don't really know how that got contaminated and polluted in that way. But I remember when I was younger, before I was married, and you're always probably thinking about your ideal mate. Now, my ideal mate was like, oh, somebody very intelligent in the philosophy section of Barnes & Noble bookstore. And I walk in, and there she was. Like, oh, the philosophy section. And I'd walk up and be like, oh, God, she's reading tarot cards in the metaphysics section. Asked it, right? She's into superstition. Um, not now. They, I don't know why they put New Age occultism and spiritualism next to philosophy. They do it in every bookstore, but that meaning has been corrupted. It meant physics. Aristotle wrote the book The Physics, which includes everything in physical nature, kusus. And then, after he covered everything that exists in physical nature, he had this really creative title for his next book. Well, what else have I left out? Well, whatever comes after, or next after, physics. Well, that's literally what metaphysics means, after the physics. Isn't that just the most creative title? What's the name of your new book? I don't know, the next book, yeah, after physics. Or as Dr. Ray says, at man. What's, in, what's your new record like? Act math. I mean metaphysics. <laughs> right? um, so you write the physics, then the metaphysics. That was the original meaning, is that after we've covered every physical particular thing, to think about questions in the largest sense, everything after physics, thinking about being Numbers, even thinking about the philosophy of mathematics, is doing metaphysics. So you're really doing this stuff up here. Okay, now Parmenides says that, let me phrase it in a question. Do you think that being is one or many? I don't want to say one thing because it's not one thing. Is it a concept of oneness or is it a concept of manyness? Manyness. Let me, if you're confused, then let me draw a particular tangible illustration. 
imagine the question is put in a diagram like this. Is being one or many? And you can answer like, oh, Billy Clinton. It depends what you mean by the word is. You remember that? So Bill Clinton gets in trouble with for the Monica Lewinsky incident. It says, did you have relations with Monica Lewinsky? It says, well, it depends on what you mean by the word is. Me mm -hmm. having a <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. They're all uh, sophists, which we'll get into a little bit uh, when we get into Plato and Socrates were going after the sophists. Sophists were basically modern day, what we would call them in the modern age, relativists. And that's why Plato says, I'm not concerned with opinions, man. I'm concerned with knowledge. Now, Sophists often seemed like philosophers. And philosophers are lovers of wisdom. Sophists are lovers of power. So they go to school to study rhetoric and philosophy, not because they generally think there's a thing out there called objective truth, but because they want to manipulate and convince you. So they're going to use the tools of philosophy not to get wisdom, but power. So they were famous for convincing you this pen is actually green. And then you, you can see but the pen's not green. And then back and forth and you call them out as being a sophist. It's like, what are you doing? I imagine you've all met people like that and maybe you even thought philosophy was going to be like that. But people that argue just for the sake of arguing. How many people have met somebody like that? Don't you just want to punch it with the Adam's apple? <laughs> right. So frustrating. It's like they start taking one side and then all of a sudden switch into the... It's like, we're not really trying to work together here to find out something, are you? Are we? You're trying to... This is a battle. My husband, got his bachelor's at philosophy. I don't know how many times if I did it, but because he can never give me a straight answer, he's always arguing my point. And I'm just like, why do you have to argue my point? Why can't you disagree with me? Is that why you're taking philosophy? Yeah. 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 <laughs> We're going to train you, Calories, and we'll have the, the famous battle right out here. That would be fantastic. Well, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll be, uh, not exactly. We'll start selling tickets. Fundraiser. Battle of the century. That's, that's a great idea. Well, that could be a good idea, too, for your uh, one of your group presentations. Yeah. So, okay, let's go back to, well, let me just uh, finish up the, the thought on the sophists. So that's sophistical. You know, arguing for the sake of arguing rather than arguing and debating because you both want to actually get down to the bottom of it and figure out what the truth of the matter is. So guess what the sophists in ancient Greece, they went and studied philosophy and rhetoric, debate, and they all went into one profession. Can you guess? And there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing has changed, really. What profession? Politics. Close. Politics. They're all politicians. Politicians are not concerned with truth, but power. Manipulating you for the vote. For the vote so that you get power. So that they can put you in a cage and <laughs> control you. Whatever they want to do. I don't know. I'm not concerned with sophists. Okay, let's go back to is being one or is it many? Okay, if you believe it's many, then what you basically, suppose this was your grab bag uh, of things. 
And you include triangles, people, houses, everything that you that exists. And you include trees. And let's say we get everything. If somebody asked you, what do you mean by a beam? Can you illustrate that? They would say, well, it's simply collection or class of all things that you can say exist or be. So that's not being, that's not being, that's not being. Somebody might say, well, it's just the, it's the sum. It's the sum total of existing things. That might be a way of thinking about being as many. That it's opposed to the idea of what would being as one. How could you illustrate that? Is it proper? Yeah, that's a great point. Did you say that? Yeah, that's. So think about a potential house. What's the difference between a potential house and an actual house? It is. Yeah, one's built and it exists, and the other one is just an idea. Exactly. So imagine everything that potentially could exist but doesn't. Now, what did we say being is? Existence. Being is existence or business. Is that cool word, isn't this? Don't get up with my isness. <laughs> well, everything that exists must have existence. And if existence isn't separate from all the things that could potentially exist, then we might have a problem. Let me put it another way. Could this pen have a property green if greenness didn't exist? It would be if I green. said this pen is green and somebody says there's no such thing as green, well, could it be green if green never existed? So how could we say all the things exist if there is not some type of transcendent concept of existence by which all the potential things get their existence. So I can't make something green unless there is some type of abstract concept exists called green, of which, because otherwise I might make it red or blue. So, now is this blueness itself? No. I'm taking the archetype or the pattern or the form, something universal, and I'm patterning whatever I'm trying to make after that, just like you would house. How do you construct a house? Well, off of an idea. Otherwise, you're not going to get a house. Can't we say the same thing here is that, no, existence is not just simply adding everything up that exists, because isn't that circular reasoning? That doesn't explain how they have existence, how each thing has existence. There must be something. Here, everything is what we would call, in philosophy, eminent. Eminent is, or imp, eminent is in the thing versus transcendent. That comes from two Latin words, sendare, which means to stand across 
or to, to stand, and trans means over or across or through. So if something, if you say, well, that's transcendent, that means it doesn't exist primarily in things, but outside, over and above. So if you thought being is many, it's simply just the sum total of the collection of all things that exist. So you can't associate it with any particular thing, but if you add them all up, that's what we mean by being. But if you want to go with being is one, what you're probably saying is, no, it's something transcendent. It's that by which all things that possibly could exist and do exist, that they're being. Well, then you could remember put the question mark down farther. Well, then how do the relations exist? So those are things that could be said to exist in different ways, but does that give an account of what existence or being is? Aren't we presupposing it already in talking about ways things can relate to one another? Because relation is only one type of existence, the way that things can be. But it really doesn't answer the question, we don't put the question mark on far enough, yeah, but what about being? Where is that to be found? Now, let me give you a mathematics argument to prove, what is, by the way, what does Parmenides think? Does he think being is one or many? Okay, where in the text? Can you find it? One way only left to be spoken is that it is, and on this way are full of many signs, that being is ungenerated, unperishable, um, for its complete, removable, without end, it never was, nor it will be, since it is now, all at once. What's he saying it is? One. One. Okay. Let me explain probably how you reason through this. Do you remember I talked about how to do a reductio ad absurdum argument? You presuppose, you do mathematics, but it's called argument by contradiction. You presuppose the opposite of what we want to prove. If he's saying it's one, let's suppose for the sake of the argument, it's not, it's many. And if you hear somebody say that, oh, for, let's suppose for the sake of the argument, that's a clue that, uh-oh, somebody's going to give us a reduction of <coughs> certain. So let's suppose this, it's many. Now, how could I illustrate that? Well, I know if one, <coughs> everything in the box, and let's just say that, um, ignore the whole thing that there would be anything outside of the box. But clearly, what is that, one or many? It's one. How do I make a box into many? Add it up into little boxes. Now I have many. So I'm just giving you a visual illustration of, let's say, A. B, C, and D. Now, if being is many, then premise one. A is being. Correct? B is also being by supposition. Assuming that everything we box is being, that being is many, then we can associate being with every box. Why? Because it means many. 
C as being and D. I'm a spot. A does not equal B. A is in the left, upper left quadrant. In other words, upper left is not equal to upper right. Correct? Okay. Remember an algebra substitution method? Why don't you just substitute that right into there? And how is it going to read? Six. B does not equal B by substitution method. Number seven, from a seven. Why don't you substitute for B? B equals what? B does not equal B. What is that called? Absurd. And if your only options were either one or two, by process of elimination, that led us to a contradiction, an absurdity. Therefore, the only one way is exactly the one way that Parmenides says being must be one. Pretty cool, huh? So I actually showed you, and some of you even had this question in some of the earlier lectures. Well, how do we get, if everybody has different opinions of things, how do we get to objective truth? Use logic. Even math, because mathematics is using logic. And if you're careful in your steps and apply the correct methodology, there is no other way you can go. Not the way of opinion, but the way of truth. That being is one. So this is also setting up for Plato. Because Plato is going to take this concept that as well. I don't want to give away too much. Let's do something really fun, shall we? Depends what you're, what you mean by is. Depends what you mean. Depends what you mean by me, right? University was Plato's Academy. Prior to that, you had little schools, like little, almost like clubs that would meet around the yeah, little cults. Called? Some of them actually were cults. Pythagoras and yeah, it was, it was, they were strange. Um, they did ceremonies. Um, well, they sacrificed male virgins. No, I'm kidding. I'm just <laughs> that always kind of sounds funny. Yeah. Yeah. Bring out the male virgin to be sacrificed. They were doing geomancy. Um, magic with numbers. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? They were actually... Well, they actually, yeah, they they thought some weird stuff. Are they in the way of Yeah, they're in your, absolutely, they're in the uh, Pythagoras, the Pythagorean call. Yeah, it's, you know what's funny? I need to bring my friend in. Um, I call him the magician logician. Wouldn't that make lectures so much better if... Um, when I was lecturing, I could just like birds would like <laughs> fire and yeah. Good idea. Thank you for sharing that. I'll incorporate 
uh, magic into my lectures. Uh, I should bring my friend Ken in because he does some great magic. And he ties it into philosophy because it's all about deception. He's like, what did you just buy into that made you think that this was half of the way? Because you know it's like, actually not me. Okay, I'll hold off on all of it. I just met with him, so I want to, that's a great idea. Okay, Zeno is famous for the paradox of emotion. They believe, just like, because they're in the same school, that all reality is one. Now, if all reality is one, suppose that I say this is place A. I'm standing and pointing to place A. And this is point B. In order for me to move from one place to another, don't they have to be in different places? If I said, hey, watch me move. <laughs> You didn't move, you stayed in the same place. So in order for there to be motion, there must be difference, difference of place. A must be different from B in terms of place, so that now I'm leaving one place and I'm moving to the next place. Because if it turns out that A and B are the same place, then I haven't moved anywhere. But if everything is one, there is no difference in place, and therefore motion is an illusion. It's not real. Now, going back to the categories of, well, do they fit into rationalists or more the empiricist? Well, they would be rationalists because they'd say, Don't, you better not bet on your senses. Why? Because your senses, remember the, the rubber pen? are constantly deceiving you. Or if I took an apple, I said, look at this. I walk out 800 yards, and it's like, wow, it shrank. And then I came back. Well, that's what your senses are telling you, that the apple's getting smaller. Is it really getting smaller? No. How do you explain that it looks like it's getting smaller? Is it moving from moving away from you? Yeah. So you have to use, yeah, and explain in terms of, or a portion, or if I put this pen into a glass of water, oh wow, it's now bent. Is that true? That's what your senses are telling you. But you would use your rational mind to correct that in terms of light and refraction. That it's giving the illusion that this is what they would say, it looks like things are moving, but your senses tell you all kinds of lies. You have to use your mind and your intellect to be able to correct that, because you can't trust your senses. They're constantly deceiving you. So the way that Zeno illustrates this is paradoxes concerning motion. The famous one is Achilles and the tortoise. How many people have heard of Achilles? That's right. Now Achilles was a, is really fast. He's, a, he's one of the Greek heroes. Um, the tortoise is really slow. Animal, correct? Here's the paradox. And paradoxes are not contradictions. They're apparent contradictions. That's why they're so fun. Is because we know it can't be but it seems like a contradiction. Now I want to explain it. I have, as the Greeks would say, an aporia, a problem, and I want to resolve the problem. There's some sort of tension in my mind between one thing and another, and I need to resolve it. So the tension here is that I know Achilles is going to catch up to that tortoise in this race. Yet, according to mathematics and reason, he can never catch up. Um, now, according to Zeno's paradox, he gives, well, we've got to give the slow tortoises a head start. This just wouldn't be fair. 
give the tortoise head start T, that distance, whatever distance you want. So the paradox is, okay, go. Now, when Achilles gets to point T, the tortoise has moved here. So we can say now Achilles is at A. The A stands for Achilles and T, tortoise. So as soon as Achilles gets here, the tortoise is moved a little bit. So, well, it should be fairly easy for Achilles to catch up. Sure. So once Achilles gets here, well, the tortoise wasn't standing completely still, so it moved a little bit. And he's going to try to catch up. Now, how many times can I do that? Infinitely. As long as he's moving, I can still add a smaller and smaller distance. So each time he catches up to the previous point, the tortoise has moved a little bit smaller point. So according to the mathematical reasoning is, no, Achilles never, even if you have an infinite amount of time, will never catch, he'll get closer and closer and closer, but never reach the tortoise. Isn't that? But you know that that's not possible because if we put a tortoise in here and we race and give it a head start, we would catch up. Now, Zeno would say, that's because your senses are deceiving you. You're not, you're not moving. Why? Because everything's one. There aren't two points. So this is ways to kind of illustrate. The other one is the, the arrow paradox. Oh, here's a, here's a better way. If you want the actual mathematics, I'll put this up for you here. So uh, the tortoise gets... Uh, let's say one, one um, kilometer start, head start. Okay, so once Achilles, and the tortoise keeps moving, once Achilles gets to one kilometer, the tortoise has moved a half a kilometer. So one plus half, and then once he gets to one and a half kilometers, the tortoise has moved an additional quarter of a kilometer so on and so on and so on at infinitum. So according to mathematical reasoning and logic, you know, Achilles can never actually catch up with the tortoise. Isn't that crazy? Yes? Um, you can only break it down so, so much before it's, uh, or you can only break it down like infinitely. Like, yeah, this goes back to mathematics and the concept of lines. If I have line AB, I can clearly divide line B, AB in half. Now I have line AC. I can divide line AC in half. So now I have line AD in half. It would be an eighth. Okay, so E, A, E. How many halves of a half can I take? Infinite. I can just keep going forever. But you didn't know that. You can divide a line infinitely. Let me show you another example of the arrow. You want to shoot this fully all right here. Okay? But you can't because motion is an illusion. These are not the Jedi's that you're looking for. <laughs> so in order get to him, you have to go at least halfway, correct? It's, it's the same concept. Um, now after you get halfway, don't you have to go, well at the very least, half of half, which is a quarter. Half of a quarter and an eighth, half of an eighth, a sixteenth. Well, same problem. Add infinitum, it's like forever getting closer, but it's never reaching you. Like, uh, uh, uh. well, this thing's never going to hit me because he knows right, motion is illusion, but then you get hit and you die. <laughs> and you're like, paradox. I guess I'm not dead, but I really am. <laughs> How about another one?
So you can think about it in reverse. Because one way to look at it is that not only does the arrow never get to the target, it never even gets started, according to Zeno. How is that possible? Because, like I said, in order for the horse to get to point B from A, you're going to have to say at least the horse has to go halfway. I'll, I'll play the horse. We'll act out charades. Oh, Zeno's paradox. Well, before I can get halfway, if I was the horse, maybe I should be like this. Huh? Before I could get halfway, I have to go at least half of that. Before I get a quarter away, half of that, then I have to go half of that, an eighth of the way, so on and so on, ad infinitum. So do I even, can I even get to the first point? Well, for, do you know how many divisions between A and the first point there are? An infinite amount of divisions. You'd have to go through an infinite amount of points. So, Zena concludes, you, nothing, no, there's nothing even gets started. So he, he says that you're already at point B. Yeah. The difference between point A and B is an illusion. If everything is one versus, if things were many, then a and B are not the same. But if everything is one, A and B are really the same, and we're just deceived in thinking that they're different. This is driving me crazy now. It's like a riddle. Some people like riddles, some people don't. And you don't like it because you can't figure it out, but I know the answer. No. Uh, Aristotle solves this problem. That's your answer. And the way he solves it, how many people remember in mathematics the difference between continuous and discrete? It's discrete as far as quantities or lines. Continuous goes on forever as the arrow, and discrete has a discrete. Uh, or it could, discrete could be parts. For example, if I had a discrete magnitude of Lego blocks, I could divide them into the simplest parts, blocks. Um, so I can't keep dividing infinitely. I divide down to the smallest parts, and then if I add up 20 Lego blocks, then I get two feet. That would be a discrete quantity. Also, film is discrete, but it's giving the illusion of continuous motion because film is simply still frames, still shots. How do you get it to look like everything's moving? Yeah. How many people used to do the little doodle cartoon man? Isn't that great? So you draw still frames on there, and then what you do is you move it, and it looks like the little man's moving, He's raising his hand and waving at me. Okay, that's discrete motion. It's, but continuous quantity or continuous motion would be something like I have the line AB and I can continually divide. So one is in terms, continuous is infinite division, discrete is composition. Here is the confusion. We're confusing the two concepts. Just because you can divide a line infinitely does not mean that it's composed of infinite parts. It's a failure to make the distinction between discrete and continuous. Yes, if I had a discrete magnitude, like the Lego blocks, I can divide that into parts because it's composed of the parts. But a line is not composed in the, of an infinite amount of parts. The problem is, for example, if line A, B. Now a point has no part. In mathematics, a point is a breathless length. It marks extremities. So yes, I know I can 
I can divide the point here, the material point. But mathematics is not material, it's abstract. So when you define, as Euclid does in his elements, who is the, the founder of geometry, a point is that which has no parts. You can't divide it. Therefore, it marks extremities. So you could say, rather than building up pieces, what you do in mathematics, let there be line AB. Well, how do you do that? Point A, point B, let there be fiat in Latin. Let it be. You create it. Now you can divide it by marking using a point with another extremity. But if a, a point has no extension, since it has no parts, has no, it would be absurd to think that, Aristotle says, as if it would be absurd to think like Zeno that a line is composed of an infinite amount of points. You can divide it infinitely, but it's not composed of an infinite amount of points or parts. Why? Because, okay, we'll try it. Okay, I'm go there's one point there. Now I'm going to add another point. Okay, another point, another point. Now, am I getting any magnitude? An infinite amount of no extensions doesn't magically add up to you. Oh, oh wow. Land of make-believe. It doesn't happen. So, what Aristotle does is he makes a distinction that all philosophers should. You're not distinguishing between continuous quantities, which can be divided ad infinitum, versus discrete quantities that are composed by taking units as parts and attaching them together. What you think about is the still frames that you're going through. Pretty nifty, huh? So paradox solved for now. Okay, so for homework, I am going to assign how many people have heard of Plato's Cave? We're going to read Plato's Cave, and then I'll put a, a document on Plato's Theory of Forms. Plato's Theory of Forms is going to solve the problem that was set up by Heraclitus. That if you can't, everything's in flux and change, that we can't know anything. Because knowing or trying to name something is to take like a still shot. It is. It is the tree. Well, now it's burnt down and it's not. So if everything's constantly changing, you can have no, no knowledge. It would be like trying, it would be like an, a Lewis Carroll world of Alice in Wonderland where everything's growing and shrinking. You're trying to take and measure things but your ruler keeps growing and changing, you wouldn't be able to measure anything. And likewise, with trying to measure reality, you need a arche, a rule, a ruler that doesn't change so that you can apply that as a principle to, so this is what Plato is going to do. He is going to find a concept of something that does not change. And that will be the standard for knowledge. Sound good? good. Alright guys, have a great week and a great weekend.